Okay, uh, good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Piers McHenry. I'm a lecturer in geography and especially in migration studies in University College Cork. And I'd like to say, first of all, that I'm really delighted that um, my university, UCC, University College Cork, has become a member of this um, unique consortium, uh, which is really exciting because, especially for a geographer, since we are now linking right across Europe uh, from the far northwest here in Cork to the southeast and Istanbul. And that really makes it an extraordinarily um, interesting and challenging network to belong to uh, because we have an opportunity to study problems in common across all of the European continent and look at our different and shared approaches to questions like migration, which is one of the uh, questions facing us, I think, uh, today in a way that it never has before. So it's a really exciting opportunity to be part of this uh, series of seminars, which is looking at the impact of um, coronavirus on the question of migration more generally. I should say before I begin, by the way, that if I'm speaking too quickly, which is probably a bad habit of mine, like most native speakers, please just raise your hand and tell me to slow down. So I, I, I don't, I, I will take no objection to that. <laughs> it happens every year with Erasmus students. They put their hands up and say, the lecturer is speaking too quickly. Mm -hmm. So um, if that happens, uh, please don't hesitate. Um, my topic today, and I recognize that many of the people watching this will not be familiar with Ireland or migration in Ireland. So I will be talking about coronavirus and the impact it's having on a particular group of migrants here, and that is the community of asylum seekers. But I will be, first of all, seeking to put this in a broader context. So um, my subject, uh, and it's part, as you see, of this lecture series, Migration and Corona, and thanks again to Ludger for organizing this. It's a, it's a marvelous opportunity. Um, I'm going to be looking at a particular question, um, the impact of coronavirus, on, um, uh, sorry, of COVID-19, let's be accurate here, uh, on a particular migrant uh, population which can be described as a vulnerable population. And by the way, the, the picture you see here, which I chose for this, is, is actually not taken in Ireland. I took it myself on the Boulevard Saint-Michel in 2016 in Paris at the time when the, um, the crisis of the Middle East and in Syria uh, was at its very height. Uh, and I thought it was a very powerful image uh, of a migrant and his daughter um, with no resources in the street. I often wonder what happened to them since. Um, so I want to look at, at, at the Irish picture. And I should say, first of all, that I recognize that some of our problems here may seem rather minor compared to countries which have a major, major issue of large numbers of migrants. I lived myself in Lebanon in the 1980s during the war there. I went back there last year and discovered that right now there are more than 900,000 displaced Syrians within the borders of Lebanon, as well as half a million Palestinian refugees. Uh, that is a true challenge for a country that is less than 7 million people. By comparison, um, I need to bear in mind that here in Ireland, the numbers are not on that scale or anything like it. But nonetheless, the issues that arise are similar for all of us. So I want to look at a number of things here. I want to look at the background. Um, how does a country like Ireland approach the question of, of migration and especially of asylum seekers? <coughs> how do we define the nation? How do we think about migration? <coughs> what is our own history of migration? What has been our response to asylum and refugee questions? Um, what have we done in the recent past? And I'm going to talk about a particular system we use here called the direct provision system. Um, how have uh, the problems caused by COVID-19 and the crisis we're all traversing at the moment impacted on asylum seekers here in Ireland. And then I'm going to talk at the end about one particular initiative uh, called Cork City of Sanctuary, which is actually based on a British model to develop the idea of a sanctuary city as a welcoming place uh, for migrants and asylum seekers. And I'll be looking a little bit at that. So that's roughly um, what I plan to do in the next I suppose 40 or 45 minutes. I have a long presentation and I'll probably skip over some of the slides, but it's already on the associated site for this particular um, course. So people can look at it um, in, in their own time after, after this is over. So first of all, um, in terms of migrants and nations, and this is a question I think which all of us have a different approach to. And I think what I would say about the Irish case is that we have two traditions, if you like, of nationalism here. 
Um, and I would describe one, and this will be familiar to all of you, I think, as what you might call the ethno-national blood and soil essentialist view of a nation, which is based on the idea of a unique shared history, quite often based on the idea of race as well. Sometimes it's a shared language, a shared religion, all of that kind of idea, which we can associate in particular with thinkers like Herder, uh, the German philosopher. And the other kind of nationalism is the kind which we might call political nationalism. And I think the origins of that lie in 1789 and the French Revolution. And in the Irish case, you can see both strands present in how we define the nation. And here we have, um, I suppose, the founding figure uh, in many respects of Irish nationalism, a man called Theobald Wolfe Tone, who um, was in France as part, uh, came to, to Ireland with, uh, with the French uh, uh, as part of an invading army, if you like, and had an idea of um, cutting the connection with England. That was his main ambition. And here we have um, a famous statement of his, uh, of his political idea to unite the whole people of Ireland, to abolish the memory of all past dissensions and to substitute the common name of Irishman in the place of the denominations of Protestant, Catholic and dissenter. So the point I'm trying to make is that Wolf Tone's idea of the Irish nation was an inclusive one. Uh, it didn't depend on having a particular racial origin, for instance, and therefore it's, it's different from and broader than that kind of narrow nationalism, which we also find uh, across uh, our European traditions. Um, the other kind of narrower view of this, though, and I don't want to deny this, is the, the, the more narrow, um, exclusive, often racially based idea. And here we have two small illustrations of that. One is from something called the Irish Race Convention. And a number of these Irish Race Conventions took place towards the end of the 19th century and the early 20th century. And the idea very much there was influenced, obviously, by European thinking about race and nation, that there was such a thing, for instance, as the Irish race, which is a manifest nonsense, of course. We are a mongrel people, like most uh, countries. We are made up of people of different origins, of different ethnic backgrounds. And you also had in Ireland, as elsewhere in Europe, a specifically anti-Semitic strand. Uh, here we have a, a, a statement, for instance, from Arthur Griffiths, and he would have been one of the founding fathers, and I say fathers advisedly because they nearly all were men, of, of the Irish um, independence movement. And here we have him writing in 1904, no thoughtful Irishman or woman can view without apprehension the continuous influx of Jews into Ireland and the continuing efflux of the native population. The stalwart men and bright-eyed women of our race pass from our land in a never-ending stream, and in their place we're getting strange people, alien to us in thought, alien to us in sympathy, from Russia, Poland, Germany, and Austria, people who came to live amongst us, but who never became of us. So my point is that you have these two competing traditions when it comes to the nation. You have the broad, inclusive, political nationhood that Wolf Tone stands for on the one hand, and on the other, you have this um, narrower uh, nationalism, which would be familiar to people from, from Germany to France, to indeed to Turkey, to all parts of Europe, of the exclusive nation, which uh, depends on this uh, supposed or imagined unity, and which sees everybody else as a threat, and which sees aliens in particular, as they saw them, as possibly disrupting the unity and the harmony of the nation. So you have these kind of two competing strands in Ireland, as you have, I think, in all countries to a greater or lesser extent. Um, I think the point I'd want to make is that <coughs> the dominant strand in Ireland um, then and now is that more French Republican influenced, Wolf Tone inspired view of the political concept of nationhood as inclusive, as non sectarian, as not based on race. And that has enabled us, if you like, to absorb people from other countries, maybe without quite the same tensions, but not, I, I don't want to be complacent about that either. Uh, so it has been the dominant view. And that's one of the reasons, for instance, why we don't in Ireland right now, in the present day, have a far right political movement, uh, such as we are seeing emerging in other European countries. You have it, obviously, in, in Orban's um, Hungary, you have, um, I don't have to name all the parties, but I think you know the ones I'm talking about, whether it's Germany, France, Greece, Spain, Italy. We have seen the emergence of this far right, xenophobic, uh, anti-immigrant tendency in most European countries. I think actually there are only two exceptions to that right now, and those are Ireland and Portugal, where such people uh, do not receive any support politically. But that does not mean to say that we are not also um, subject to 
tendencies or currents of racism and xenophobia here as in other countries. Of course we are, and I, I don't suggest otherwise. So to look at our own migration history then as well, because this is part of what forms the, the background and the mindset uh, of Irish people. And I suppose the main point to make is that for, for centuries really, we have been a country of emigration, not a country of immigration. In fact, immigration is an extraordinarily recent phenomenon here. This particular chart, now this focuses on countries from the, if you like, the global north. Um, most of the data here is from the OECD, but it shows the countries with the most people living overseas. In other words, people born in a particular country living outside the territories of that country. Now remember that the worldwide global average, you know, if you were to ask the question, how many people in the world today live outside their country of origin? Um, the answer would be maybe surprising to some because it's not much more than 3%. But obviously within that global figure, there are enormous variations. And this one here is quite interesting because it shows that in the case of Ireland, we're actually at the top in terms of developed countries uh, of, of the list of countries uh, who have a large percentage of their, uh, those born there living outside. In fact, Ireland is 17.5% uh, of Irish people uh, who are still alive at this moment live outside Ireland. And the next country is New Zealand, hardly surprising. It's a small island um, nation a long way from anywhere. And then we have Portugal, and Ireland and Portugal, in fact, have, have much in common in this area. Uh, and again, if we look at this uh, small illustration, um, the impact of the Irish, um, this is a rather, um, there's a kind of self-praise involved here. We think we're wonderful. And this kind of illustrates uh, the, the claimed size of the Irish diaspora, people who have at least some Irish um, uh, origins and 70 to 80 million around the world would be the claimed figure. Now that can be disputed, but it, it, you can put it in comparison <coughs> with the population on this island, uh, which, which uh, when you combine the north and the south is, is fewer than 7 million. So we have this idea of a country whose impact uh, beyond its borders is disproportionate and, and large. And you have the, the very significant presence of Irish people around the world, not only in the United States, in Canada, in Australia, in New Zealand, but also in some unlikely places. There's a, a strong Irish community, for instance, in Argentina. So they have, they have changed language. But um, we have this image, therefore, of ourselves as being, we were the ones who left and went somewhere else. But by comparison, very few people came here. And in that sense, um, it has probably formed our, our attitudes in certain respects towards immigrants, in spite of what I said a moment ago about the, the broad political tradition. At the same time, immigrants were fairly exotic and unusual and not very numerous until fairly recently. So that the Ireland that I grew up in, for instance, I'm in my 60s now, is a very different country from the one which anybody visiting now would see. Uh, my own city here of Cork now has a population where 14%, one four, was born outside the country. Uh, it would have been probably 2 to 3% uh, back in the early 1980s. So just to illustrate, again, our history is very much one of emigration. This shows you, for instance, very briefly this chart, uh, the 20th century up to almost the present day. Uh, and this is tracking um, net migration flows. And you can see that for most of the 20th century, from 1900 up to really the 1980s, the, the pattern was one of ever um, dominant um, net migration. Far more people were leaving uh, than were arriving here. And when I say leaving, I mean in very, very large numbers. So you have certain periods of extremely high emigration. Uh, the period of the 1920s, just after independence, um, was a period of high emigration, which is not a great vote of confidence in a new state. And then after the Second World War, there was also a period of recession. We had a very conservative economic policy, very little foreign direct investment, very few opportunities outside agriculture for people seeking work. So people left in very large numbers. And that changes really um, by the late 1970s when we joined uh, what was then called the European Economic Community, the EU nowadays in 1973, and the economy uh, did take off and you can see there, 1979, uh, in the screen, uh, that in fact there was net immigration at that time for the first time. But I should say that most of that actually wasn't really immigration, it was returning emigration. So when the Irish economy boomed, people with skilled trades, for instance, who had emigrated to Britain to work 
let's say, in construction there, they returned with their families. So you got for the first time a net figure of, of immigration, um, exceeding emigration. But we don't yet have um, a large foreign population without that previous ethnic and birth association with Ireland. That really only begins to change um, in the 1990s. So if we look, for instance, at this chart here, and again, I, I won't go into it in detail, but it traverses the period from 1988 to 2005, which was a period of economic boom in Ireland, what was called the Celtic Tiger, a period of very strong economic growth, sometimes of six, seven, even 8% per annum in the late 1990s. And the red line there in this chart shows gross immigration. And what it shows basically is that immigration really begins to take off in the early 1990s. And it pursues that upward path until there is a crash in 2008. So just to illustrate um, the impact this had, here we have foreigners in Ireland in 1986, which is 34 years ago, and that's taking census data. And the point I want to make here is that the number of foreigners in Ireland is actually insignificant. And most of them come from countries which are culturally and linguistically very close to us. So you have, for instance, uh, uh, only 15,000 um, Americans living in this country. Uh, of, of a population which was then um, not much more than 3 million, but it's a very, very small number. You had very small numbers from other continental European countries, our new neighbours in the EEC. And then that category there on the right hand side, other um, people from the rest of the world, if you like, um, and fewer than 20,000 of them in the country as a whole. In fact, if you take the people born in Britain and people born in the United States aside for a moment and look at the rest of the world, it's only something like a half percent, 0.5 percent of the population in 1986. And that's what really changes <coughs> in the following 20 years. This is the picture from 1996. And again, you can see um, it has um, a bit more breakdown, but you're getting, for instance, some presence there of people from African and Asian countries. Again, very small numbers, 8,000 from all of Asia. Uh, they would include, for instance, specialists uh, for instance, paramedical people like the Filipino nurses we have here. Uh, again, with Africa, uh, not very many, but, you know, uh, a few thousand. So the, it's beginning to change. And if we then move forward and look at this chart, these are people who lived abroad, um, and the census begins to track this at a certain point in slightly more uh, detailed ways. So if we look at this particular chart, it shows from 19, the 1960s onwards, and the point really is that the main people coming to live in Ireland in those days, the 60s and 70s, insofar as there were any, which was not very numerous, would have been from Britain in the first place. Then you gradually get the arrival of people from other EEC countries. Um, they're, they're shown on the chart there. But the one I want you to look at then is the one with the small dots. And you can see that chart by the time we get to 2001, 2006, 2011, those are the census years. That figure is the one that's increasing most rapidly. So immigration from the rest of the world, which includes asylum seekers, and I'll be coming back to that, that begins to increase very markedly in the period from the 1990s onwards. So the point I'm trying to make is that we go from being a country which was very, very homogenous, very monocultural, um, almost exclusively um, connected to the English-speaking world. There's a gradual opening towards the rest of Europe from the 1970s onwards, and that is reflected in immigration. And then as we become a part of a more globalized economy in the 1990s um, down to the present day, you really get a, a, a substantial increase in immigrants coming from all around the world. But it's a very recent phenomenon. So Ireland has gone through um, a, a very rapidly accelerated process of change in this regard, uh, compared, I think, to most other countries in Europe where these kinds of changes in immigration began to occur already after the Second World War. So there, there's, there's a big difference there, I think, in our experience compared to others. Here we have the figure from the most recent census, which is 2016. And it shows that by now, um, people who are not Irish and have not taken out Irish citizenship constitute something like just under 12% of the population, which is where we are at the moment. Um, again, that's, that's well up now with the typical figures in other European countries. So we are no longer an outlier in terms of being a country almost exclusively of emigration. And that has meant 
a huge change in, in mindset and in culture and how we think of ourselves and how we think of things like nationhood and citizenship uh, compared to the past. So that's, that's a bit of background. Um, in terms of asylum and refugee policy, uh, again, there are positives and negatives here when we consider these questions. Um, and the first one, you, you may wonder why I'm referring to the famine. Um, there's an interesting point there. I read this morning in the Irish and international media that the um, coronavirus uh, crisis has had a particular impact on certain Native American tribes, including the Choctaw and the Navajo. And they have opened a funding uh, campaign to help people who are in very serious trouble and where there's a high rate of this disease afflicting those communities who are marginalized within the American context. And the, the largest foreign contributions to those funds have come from a most unlikely source. They've come from Ireland. And the reason for that is because when the Irish famine occurred, which was one of the last great European famines, although Ukraine comes much later in 1930, the Irish famine occurred in the 1840s and 1850s, and more than a million people died and more than a million left. And one of the peoples who helped the Irish in that time were the Choctaw Indians, Native Americans who sent money, and they had little money enough at the time, and they are now being remembered uh, by the Irish who are sending money to them in their time of need in the middle of this coronavirus uh, crisis. The point I'm trying to make there is that the famine, in terms of its impact on the Irish imagination and identity, is still a big part of our collective um, cultural consciousness. When we had a, um, 150th anniversary commemorations in 1997 of the beginning of the famine, it was a big event. And it was a way of reconnecting with other people around the world who in similar ways um, are experiencing that kind of catastrophe. So there's always been a disproportionate um, Irish commitment to things like um, aid operations in the global south. And you find a disproportionate number of Irish aid workers in that, that kind of activity. So there is a real consciousness of the historical memory of famine and the impact it had on us, and therefore a kind of commitment to other people's experiencing um, similar kinds of situations today. And that's part, I think, of, of the Irish psyche. But it still raises the question, um, if we're so sympathetic in certain respects <coughs> towards, for instance, those experiencing famine or hardship elsewhere, um, <coughs> why do we not have quite the same empathy towards refugees and asylum seekers? And I would argue that in many respects, we don't. And that leads us to ask the question, what other elements in the formation of the modern Irish state and our own modern attitudes might be said to play a role in conditioning our present day thinking about questions like refugees and asylum seekers? And how have these other elements influenced debates and policies and laws in this country? So it's not simply a question of our being uh, able to express a certain empathy with asylum seekers and refugees and certainly then saying, well, actually we should be generous to them because we were there once. That actually doesn't happen. And it, it's interesting to me to consider why that might be the case. And these are just, I'm, I'm not going to obviously be able to give you a full history of Irish attitudes in this, but I'm going to give you some examples to illustrate this. Our first refugees, um, if that's the right term, and I think it is, uh, came to Ireland in 1956. And the reason, as some of you will know, was that at the time, um, Hungary went through a period of great trouble. Uh, when you had um, a, a rebellion against uh, Soviet rule and a lot of Hungarians fled Hungary at the time, and because this was in the middle of the Cold War, there was a considerable amount of sympathy for the Hungarians in other European countries, including Ireland. And so even though at the time we were experiencing our highest rates of emigration in the 20th century, we still took in about a thousand Hungarian refugees. As I suppose a kind of a gesture, probably also because it was politically a good, a good thing to do, uh, the Americans, in particular the United States, would have been favorable towards the idea that we should welcome people who are fleeing communism. So the Irish took in their share, about a thousand, as I say, and this is where they were um, housed. It's a place in the west of Ireland called Nakalishin, and this photograph is from a local newspaper of 1956, and you can see the Hungarians there. Now, the point I'm trying to make is that our willingness to accept them uh, was probably in part a political gesture, probably in part genuine solidarity, 
But when it came to how those people were actually treated, uh, that was a very different matter. Um, so we have on the files of the Irish Public Service Authority is a discussion of whether, for instance, these people would have the right to move freely outside the camp, which you see in this photograph. And even though we welcome them as refugees and they should have been given the full rights of any refugees, um, <coughs> it was decided nonetheless that they would not be given those rights. And they were effectively treated uh, uh, with a status which was not so different than if they had actually been prisoners in a certain sense. And their treatment, in fact, was so bad, bad I won't go into all the details, that a section of the Hungarians, and remember, these refugees were very politically minded people, actually went on hunger strike. And the whole episode ended in a fairly ignominious fashion because the Irish government had to ask the Canadian government, would they please take these refugees off our hands, which is actually what happened. The great majority of these Hungarian refugees, for the most part, very, very uh, well-qualified, intelligent, politically minded people, the great majority of them actually subsequently went to Canada. So our first um, experiment our experience of dealing with refugees was not a very edifying one in terms of the response of the state. Um, the attitudes of locals was a different matter and slightly more complex and it was a mixture of welcome on the one hand and a certain fear and suspicion on the other. So that's something which I think we find echoing down to the present day, not only in Ireland, but in other countries as well. This is an illustration of the continuity of history because this is the same place today and Nakhilishin today is still a centre, uh, almost unbelievably, a holding centre uh, for asylum seekers. And this is the modern version of the photograph you just saw. And again, while it looks a little bit more modern, a little bit less oppressive, you still have this idea of communal accommodation and to some extent communal segregation of asylum seekers as long as they're in the asylum seeking process and all of the discontent which goes with that kind of approach uh, to dealing with asylum seekers and, and uh, the fact that as human beings they may not have the full rights or full access to uh, normal society that's captured I think in photographs like this. So looking at um, the system of what I'm going to call direct provision which is my main subject really, um, first of all let's look at what actually happened in terms of asylum seeking numbers um, in Ireland in the last let's say 30 years. And here we have um, a picture which at the end of the 1980s, and remember that Celtic tiger hasn't really taken off yet, so economic opportunities are only just beginning to arrive. Um, we're still a fairly small, marginal, <coughs> and I suppose you could say peripheral European country when it comes to these matters, compared to the experiences of other parts of Europe and of course of other parts of the world because most refugees never get further than the neighboring country. And it's actually other countries in the global south which have the biggest challenges dealing with large numbers of refugees. It's not, it's not us here in Europe. But anyway, um, we had very, very few people seeking asylum in Ireland um, at the end of the 1980s, even though by then we had at least in formal terms accepted the, um, the terms of the, um, the 1951 Geneva Refugee Convention, but it wasn't something which arose in practice very much. Ireland probably didn't look like a very attractive destination anyway. Uh, it was still a fairly poor country without many opportunities. What you then get in the decade which follows, and that's the decade of the 1990s in particular, you get a fairly dramatic increase in the growth of asylum seekers. Now, it's not part of my task this morning to consider the rights and wrongs of people applying for asylum or whose cases are justified or who are not. That's a, that's a separate question really. <coughs> but I would just note that you see this very dramatic increase uh, towards the end of the 1990s. Uh, undoubtedly that's linked with a general increase in uh, asylum seeking across Europe and the world. And it's probably not a coincidence that that in turn is connected to the end of the Cold War um, with the the uh, the demolition of the, the Berlin Wall and the reunification of Germany and it's, it's been noted by other scholars that the end of the Cold War actually led to an increase in regional conflicts in other parts of the world and therefore an increase in the number of people seeking asylum. So if we look for instance at the numbers in the 1960s when the um, Geneva Convention and the New York Protocol of 1967 first came in, we were talking about a few million people 
uh, around the world seeking asylum, whereas by the 1990s that had increased by a factor of 10. So the seeking of asylum around the world is um, a phenomenon which we see really taking off in the 1990s in particular. And again, if you look at those figures on the chart there, you see that it, it, it peaks around 2002. And there's a reason for that in the Irish context, um, which was that the authorities, um, I suppose you could say, took fright or became concerned anyway at the numbers of people who were arriving by then, uh, up to a thousand a month, <coughs> excuse me, uh, by the end of the 1990s. And remember that Ireland is a small country. Uh, our population now um, is, is still um, less, less than 5 million in this jurisdiction. So that's, that's quite an impact. You can multiply that by the population of your own country to get some impression of what I mean. We didn't have the facilities to accept these people. Very few efforts were made to make um, housing available for them or to have an expedited process for dealing with their asylum cases. And you also had the perception on the part of the authorities that if these families were to settle among other local families, you quite often got a strong groundswell of local opinion in their favour. So I, something I remember myself clearly from the 1970s was campaigns mounted by school children to support um, one of their own um, fellows in school who was threatened with deportation. And that generated a kind of a political current quite often a current of support for those asylum seekers. And to some extent, this was not very welcome to the authorities. So in 2000, they introduced the system of direct provision, which meant that you would no longer have access to the normal social housing made available through the local authorities, for instance, which would be available to people without their own housing in, in any country in normal circumstances. That was closed off to asylum seekers who were obliged from then on to stay in segregated, separate uh, communal accommodation conditions, which is what we call direct provision and which I return to. And you can see it did lead to, um, among other things anyway, it was one of the factors which made Ireland a far less attractive place to come to. And you get a fall in the numbers uh, in the early 2000s, even though the economy at the time was actually um, going even more strongly until the crash of 2008. Going back to European trends, then uh, you see that um, this is looking at data from Eurostat, and we see that um, there's a kind of a steady number of asylum seekers arriving um, into the EU in the period 2008 until 2014. And then, of course, you get the impact in particular of events in Syria. And we have the crisis of 2016, and we have the very different responses to that crisis from different European countries. And of course, the most notable response there is that of Angela Merkel in Germany, when she effectively threw open the gates and said, we will take uh, maybe not as many as want to come here, but certainly in the following two years, the best part of a million asylum seekers arrived in Germany. And that's an ongoing process. And one has to say that huge efforts have been made by the German government, but also by municipalities and the different lender uh, to bring about uh, a process of integration of those asylum seekers. So and that's, that's the picture which we see. But we also have um, paralysis within the European Union more generally in dealing with asylum seekers at the moment not least because certain countries, and I'm thinking particularly of the Visegrad countries, led by Poland and Hungary, have displayed an unwillingness to accept any asylum seekers. So that has effectively paralyzed European action in this area. And in the meantime, then, smaller countries a bit further away, like Ireland, in a certain sense, we've had the luxury of being able to say, well, yes, we'll take a few thousand, but um, we've been able to hide behind the paralysis of the larger member states and we have not really addressed the, the bigger picture in terms of the needs of asylum seekers in Europe today, or in terms of the crisis <clears throat> which has arisen, especially in Greece and Italy, because of the numbers arriving there. If we look at the numbers of um, applications for international protection in Ireland in 2008-2019, you can see what I've just been saying translated here into numbers, because you have um, a decrease until about 2014. Then you have the um, growing uh, scale of the crisis in uh, Syria in particular, and also across the Middle East more generally. And you have a, a jump from there on 2015 onwards to 2019 last year, when uh, we're back to quite high levels again, nearly 5,000 applying for asylum last year. Uh, and again, um, a very wide mixture of people in those numbers, and I won't go into this in detail, but you can see there 
the, the largest community, um, single nationality, would be Syrians, and that continues to be the case. And the numbers there are, are increasing over 2017, uh, 16, 17, um, 18, and 19. I won't dwell on those in detail now. You also have um, a considerable number of people from certain African countries. Zimbabwe stands out. And again, that reflects, I think, traditional historical associations between Ireland and certain countries in Africa. For instance, the Irish Roman Catholic missionary movement would have been very strongly involved in education in countries like Nigeria and Zimbabwe. And that's one of the reasons why Ireland itself um, has tended to be a place that some people from some of these countries would at least know something about and are therefore more likely to come to in seeking asylum. Again, you've got a list there, uh, 2018, this is the most recent data I could get and it shows, it gives you a breakdown of where people are coming from and you, you can see again a very wide variety of countries represented there uh, and many um, asylum seekers um, including families arriving nowadays. So direct provision I've mentioned already, um, what was it like? Basically, it was a system which was provided um, by outsourcing. In other words, it was privatized. The government gave contracts to the private sector. And these are large-scale facilities, um, hundreds in some cases, um, 360, 400 in the case of the larger ones. It's communal accommodation provided by the private sector with communal cooking. Um, very, very few um, rights or freedoms given to the people staying in them. So, for instance, they don't have access generally to... Uh, the means of cooking their own meals, and that's a big issue. They find themselves sharing rooms with people with whom they have absolutely nothing in common, quite often not even a language. At the moment, we have about 6,000 people in those direct provision accommodation centres. There are almost 40 of them across the country. Um, and there's a further 1,700 because those systems are at capacity. They have been for some time, and new arrivals are put usually in emergency um, hotel accommodation quite unsuitable for people staying for any length of time in a place like that. It was originally intended as an emergency measure in 1999, at a time when, as I've shown you already, the numbers had, had begun to peak at about a thousand a month. And the system itself of dealing with asylum claims had, sl had slowed down to the point where it was taking years. And there are people in direct vision today who've been there for five, six, seven years while awaiting a final decision in their cases. People in direct provision are not able to access, well, there are limits on their access to education, first of all. Children, yes, up to the end of second level. But after that, it's virtually impossible to go to third level. And I'll come back to that. Employment, um, very few asylum seekers in Ireland have the right to work. They did introduce a limited scheme in the last two years. It's not working very well so far, and fewer than a third of people are even in the category that's entitled to apply for work. You can't cook for yourself and you get a weekly adult allowance of 38, 80. So in effect, you're financially excluded from society. And these issues have come up again and again. Um, so women, for instance, who want to buy the normal sanitary products that women need to use on a monthly basis, um, that comes out of that same allowance as well, which means their actual disposable income is, is, is virtually nil. So the effect has been to segregate asylum seekers and cut them off from the society around them and you're getting all of the mental health consequences which flow from that. Um, now here, by way of contrast, is an illustration of another group of undocumented migrants, which happens to be, in that case, Irish undocumented migrants in the States. Because back in the 1980s, when we had um, high immigration before the economy took off here, large numbers of Irish people went to the United States. They often had strong family connections there. Uh, the legislation was not as uh, rigorously enforced by the Americans at that stage. This was before 9-11. And many of them, uh, the figures would suggest 40 to 50,000, ended up working as undocumented migrants in the United States. The Irish government, uh, in responding to that, has persistently gone to the US government and appealed for clemency, for leniency, for regularization, and so on. In fact, this is still an ongoing issue to this day although the number of Irish undocumented now is probably in the region of five to 7,000. And the point that's been made here by the journalist, Vinton O'Toole, in his introduction to the book, After Optimism, Ireland, Race and Globalization, which is a key text published in 2006, and which I will make available um, on the, the learning platform associated with this course. The point that's been made by Vinton O'Toole is the difference in the approach towards the 
Irish undocumented in the States shown by the Irish government and their attitude towards um, undocumented or asylum seekers here in Ireland. And O'Toole um, makes this point very validly when he says, there's an underlying assumption that we, meaning us white Irish, feel pain, but that they, they in this case, um, Nigerians and other asylum seekers in Ireland do not, is implicitly racist, he says. It suggests a hierarchy of human feeling in which we are at the top and they're at the bottom. And that sort of contradiction, or if you like, hypocrisy, continues to run through um, Irish attitudes towards migrants uh, and in particular towards asylum seekers and refugees. A bit more data there showing the breakdown, but I won't go into it now on age terms. And here's another comparison, uh, Ireland and Norway, in terms of the people who actually have their applications granted within a reasonable period of time. And you can see it's extremely small in the case of Ireland and the case of Norway. Um, it's it's, it's good deal, uh, a good deal more generous. So um, the trends at the moment in Ireland, um, an increase in deportations, low levels of acceptance, I've just touched on that, protra protracted length of stay and direct provision, limited rights and protections, especially when it comes to children's rights and the most uh, the, the several children's rights organizations have said they consider that um, the law is being broken in terms of the treatment accorded to children in direct provision centers. The generally damaging provisions. Here's one example um, <clears throat> from a piece in the Irish Times, one of the main newspapers here last year. Um, asylum seekers are five times more likely to attend with a psychiatric condition compared to Irish medical card holders. They will be people um, in receipt of, of um, assistance from health services. Asylum seekers are three times more likely to be assigned a diagnosis of anxiety and 10 times more likely to suffer post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, that's a very obvious point if you're fleeing war and conflict, but we don't have the resources here adequately to deal with people with those kinds of needs suffering from PTSD. Now, what in particular are the issues then that arise uh, when it comes to direct provision constraints? Well, the big issues that we associate with coronavirus are associated with the the rules and regulations which have been introduced by the Irish government, in common with most of the European countries, dealing with the a crisis since about late March. In our case, I think it was the, the 13th of March that some of these regulations came in. So in our case, for instance, you're not allowed, well, you weren't until Tuesday of this week, to go more than two kilometres from your own house. You're supposed to um, practice social distancing at all times, um, which means that when you meet people, there must be a two metre gap between you and anybody else that you you come across. Um, there are various conditions of that kind which have proved, of course, um, a, a huge imposition on all of us, um, whether it's Ireland or Germany or anywhere else. But uh, in the case of asylum seekers, the point that has been made is that those conditions cannot be met in the type of accommodation which direct provision consists of. It's impossible to practice social distancing when you're literally sharing um, a bedroom with strangers and you're sharing communal accommodation and communal um, dining facilities and all of those kind of things with strangers and you're looking at very very crowded facilities and it has had a particular impact on people for instance the small number who are working actually include frontline health workers and yet they're going back to a place which is unsafe for them they're at risk therefore of becoming themselves the vectors of transmission of coronavirus to the environments where they are working during the day and those environments may well include highly sensitive environments such as hospitals or care homes. And that's been another big issue here in Ireland in dealing with coronavirus. It also uh, poses a challenge for people with underlying health conditions. So in every sense, um, direct provision is a completely unsuitable environment um, because of the communal nature of the accommodation for people in the uh, context of direct provision uh, and people looking at the, the threats posed by coronavirus. The fact as well that it's outsourced to the private sector has meant that all of the normal machinery of um, the regulation and the monitoring of, of health systems and sanitary systems and all of those kind of things has been less than adequate. And again, as I've mentioned before, the effects on children of the current lockdown uh, are particularly pernicious. Of course, all the schools are closed and so on, playgrounds, etc. There are no facilities that are that available to anyone. But that's less of an imposition on those of us in uh, mainstream society than it is on people in direct provision. And here we have a couple of particular cases of matters which have arisen. Um, one of the features of direct provision has been that people are sent uh, to sometimes remote towns where the facilities may not be available. 
generally speaking, in fact, I must say they have been made welcome. There has been a small movement against this kind of thing coming from the xenophobic far right, but it has not been that prominent. But what has been a matter of concern has been where decisions have been taken by the authorities. And when I say the authorities, I mean the Department of Justice, which is responsible for the asylum seeking uh, community. And people have been sent to places in conditions where they may, for instance, be unwitting carriers of coronavirus, and therefore you may have an outbreak in a, say, a small remote town which previously did not have such an outbreak uh, in its midst. And we had a case like this, for instance, this is a small town in Kerry called Karasivin, and uh, asylum seekers were sent there from Dublin, from a place where it was known there had been an outbreak of coronavirus. Within a few days in this particular small town, uh, in the centre where they were housed, uh, you got a, a fairly substantial outbreak and within a few days something like 19 to 20 cases of asylum seekers with coronavirus had been identified. Naturally that caused considerable concern and considerable tension with the local community. There were one or two politicians um, who uh, made statements that were probably not very helpful in addressing this, but by and large the townspeople expressed strong solidarity with the asylum seekers and they are now calling to be moved out of Karasivin and allowed to be uh, accommodated in conditions where um, any risk that they too might become coronavirus positive can be, um, can be controlled. So that's, that's an example of the kind of issues which have arisen. Um, there have been quite a number of complaints made about direct provision in the last couple of years, and I've just given a few um, screens here, and I'm, I'm conscious of time, so I'll try to wind up in about the next 10 minutes or so. Uh, uh, government records, for instance, has shown that this is actually a very lucrative business for the companies that have got that business of providing direct accommodation, a total since the year 2000 of 1.1 billion euros has been spent on this type of accommodation. Uh, but it has been described um, by human rights organizations and many politicians um, as it says here, the next mother and baby home scandal. That's a reference to an issue in the past in Ireland when people who got pregnant outside of marriage were effectively banished from normal society and confined in homes run by religious orders. Some were good, some were not, but the point was that they were segregated from society around them. <coughs> and we have a litany of complaints about health, hygiene, civil and human rights abuses has basically cast the system in a dim light. And Ireland has been paying private companies to house asylum seekers, the vast majority in older and unsuitable buildings which have not been modernized, where facilities are extremely basic, and where the general effect of these conditions has been to create uh, a degree of segregation between asylum seekers and the society around them. Um, and at the moment, what's been in the news the last few days is that a legal opinion has been obtained by the Irish Refugee Council, which actually um, sets out in stark detail some of these issues um, the Health Act of 2020 allows the Minister for Health by regulation to effectively criminalise the sorts of conduct such as failing to socially distance or self-isolate that the Department of Justice and Equality seeks to impose upon residents in accommodation centres by failing to provide single or household occupancy accommodation. In other words, um, the conditions which are, people are living in in direct provision centres directly contradict or flout the regulations that have been introduced to deal with the coronavirus crisis. So these people are, uh, by no fault of their own of course, unwittingly, um, they are in direct contradiction in their daily lives with the rules which have been introduced by the state to try to stop the, the, or try to prevent or slow down the spread of coronavirus. So obviously that's an issue, not just for asylum seekers themselves, but for society in general. And in a letter, um, uh, to the government uh, earlier this month, signed by 920 lawyers, doctors, public health officials and academics, it was claimed that the state may be in breach of the um, European Convention on Human Rights obligations unless it provides own door accommodation to people living in direct provision. In other words, that people at least have some access and some control themselves on the living spaces in which they live. There is, of course, a separate system. I just want to note this in passing. <clears throat> we do also have a refugee relocation and a refugee resettlement system in Ireland, and that's done in cooperation with UNHCR. And so we have situations where civil servants and the UNHCR experts go, for instance, to refugee camps in Lebanon. They interview uh, families there, and we've had uh, some thousands of those come to Ireland in the last several years, and they don't go through the direct provision system. 
they're uh, allowed to settle directly in wider society. They do get considerable supports in terms of language assistance, other kinds of social assistance, and most of them uh, quite quickly have been able to enter the workforce. So that's been an example which shows it can be done properly. Uh, but the issue, of course, is that integration of those people is already approved in advance because they come as refugees. If you're still in the waiting room, so to speak, you're not considered to be a candidate for integration and therefore none of these services is provided for you. <clears throat> so as you can see there, between 2000 and 2019, over 3,000 refugees from almost 30 nationalities have been resettled in Ireland, which shows there is a model there that works and it can be done, but there is a complete separation between that system and the system uh, known as direct provision. The word ERUC at the top means emergency um, um, resettlement and orientation centre. And these are the centres where people stay briefly while they are prepared for, if you like, entry into normal life and normal society. And finally, just to note very briefly, but um, I know the time is not on my side at this stage, but I just spend a few moments. Um, we have something here in Cork City, which is based on an interesting British model called the Cities of Sanctuary, or more widely, Places of Sanctuary. And this is a model which uh, it was founded first in only 2005, which has spread now uh, not only in, in, in Britain, but also here in Ireland. And it's based on the idea of creating a network of um, empowerment and agency, which brings together the uh, migrant communities more generally and the asylum seeking communities in particular, along with the official state agencies, whether it's the health service, uh, the municipality and the city council is the leader of this project here in Cork, the NGO sector uh, and the education sector. So the idea is to create um, a network which is based on agency, which is based on respect, which is based on building mutual understanding and mutual knowledge, and then the provision of services based on that. And that's been a very interesting model in terms of breaking down these barriers. Now, I don't, I don't have time to go into it in, in great detail now because of the time that remains, but just to illustrate, for instance, the, the, the progress made here in Cork, we've had a series of groups dealing with everything from arts and culture, spaces and places, research, advocacy, third level education, and we've provided a, a, a scholarship scheme now in my own university, but also in the other Irish universities, so people do have the opportunity to attend third level. Otherwise, they would be expected to pay the kind of um, exceptionally high fees which people from outside the EU pay in order to attend third level here. We have um, groups on primary education, secondary education, health and well-being, um, there's a women's subgroup <clears throat> and there's one dealing with children and families. And these have been really, really interesting because they've brought together on an equal basis and with equal involvement from migrants, asylum seekers, um, members of the host community, people who've worked together uh, in respect and friendship. And here we have the strategic plan of action which has been developed by the Cork City of Sanctuary Movement. And that was adopted last year by the City Council and was launched formally by the Lord Mayor. So it has that kind of official status. And here's the, the structure of it again. You've got a steering committee, an executive committee, and you've got all these different subcommittees I mentioned working. There's a, a strategic plan of action. So different forms of actions are being rolled out um, on a case-by-case -case basis. And I'll come back in a moment to the direct vision. Um, the long-term vision is to have an integration strategy in place, um, which will address the needs of all migrants in Cork City. And as that integration should begin at the moment of arrival and not when you've got out of the direct provision centre, maybe sometimes after several years. And various actions have been taken. So to become more involved, for instance, in the political structures of the city, because in Ireland you can stand and you can be active politically uh, as soon as you've arrived here at local level, not at the national parliament, but at local level. And the key thinking behind the city of sanctuary is uh, to use the words of one British academic who's written about this, Jonathan Darling, he says, instead of the regulatory environment governing asylum seekers, we should look at the relational environment. Who are the people to whom they relate and what is the, the scale of that and the context in which it happens? And the point is that the city, the city is the place where we meet each other face to face from day to day, where we use the same services as our neighbours where we relate to each other through these different services and different bodies, where in fact, we actually get to know and understand each other and each other's lives. So if you like, never mind the national policy picture, let's, let's look at the city and the city as the place where people relate to each other. 
rather than simply seeing everything in terms of the environment of regulation and control, which has been the norm up to now. But that's been the ethos uh, behind the City of Sanctuary movement. So we have intercultural dialogue, we have the city libraries, and libraries are key involvement in all this. They, they have hosted all kinds of uh, conversation sessions and other cultural events, um, launching books concerned with people's lives and experiences and so on from different places. Music is a big part of this. So we have um, word music groups and the like being, being formed here, mother and baby courses. You've got all kinds of different movements of that kind, and all of them are marked by the same kind of cooperative ethos, bringing together local people, asylum seekers, and migrants more generally. And that's been that's been very successful. Now I'm moving through all this rapidly because of the, the, the lack of time at this stage. I've gone on too long. But uh, generally speaking, if we ask what has worked, um, the action and grassroots-based nature has been successful. The networking has been successful. We still need to resource this more successfully. And we still need, in particular, to get a real buy-in, including the resources I've just mentioned from the the statutory people from the official service providers um, and the you know the health and the municipality and so on they're there we need to bring them in in an even more committed way so looking at direct provision and how that has impacted them um, we have for instance a residence platform that is something which enables all of the residents of direct provision centers to talk together in confidence and in trust with people that they trust and that's something which has been a departure from what has been the case up to now a certain lack of faith in officialdom. We have a psychosocial support service where people can telephone a number and it's available in various languages and the people who are doing it are all trained. We have something very simple, sanctuary runners. People go out and they run together and it's one of the best bridge builders you can imagine between local communities and asylum seekers. We have an initiative to, to make these wonderful masks for people, for people to wear in these coronavirus times. We have the provision of laptops for people trying to work and study in difficult circumstances in direct provision and so on. We have all these different kinds of um, developments. So to come to my, my conclusions, and I'm, I'm just finishing now, um, large-scale immigration, including the arrival of substantial numbers of asylum seekers, is new in Ireland. So we have struggled to deal with this. But I would describe Ireland now as a porous nation. We have a lot of people coming and going and returning, and that is now the way we are. The old image, I think, is gone forever. The official policy and response has lagged behind that. And that's, that that's one of the issues. Uh, in many ways, people in cities like Cork or Dublin or Galway, or our, our neighbours in Belfast are also working on this. We're ahead of official thinking on this, and that's really part of the problem. External factors do play a role. I've mentioned the paralysis, paralysis at EU level. It doesn't help in the formulation of new and more positive policies. There are also issues, in our case, with our neighbours in Britain as to their fear that if we are more generous and empowering to people like asylum seekers, ultimately those people will end up crossing the border into the UK. So we have to work out ways in which we can coordinate our policies while at the same time asserting our policies as being the right ones in this country. We still have potential for the right wing uh, to come back and build their movement. They're, they're something that has to be watched, even if they have no political strength at the moment. The, 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 the thing that helps probably in our case is that this tradition of political nationalism is still the dominant tradition. And that can be one that can adapt to a multicultural society much more than the other blood and soil approach to it. And finally, if we do learn from the coronavirus crisis, the hope must be that the lessons learned now because of the crisis will be ones that we can then apply in the longer term and make a permanent feature of our policy landscape. So sorry to have gone on a bit and I'll stop there. Thank you.